Welcome. Thank you to everyone who is joining us live for today's Lunch and Learn, the role of Maine's forests in protecting biodiversity in our climate. And welcome to all of the viewers who are watching on YouTube. A new report finds that the world lost 200 million acres of forest between 1960 and 2019 with 17.5 million acres of forest, Maine is the most heavily forested state in the nation. What do those two facts mean for climate change and biodiversity? What are the threats? What policies can help? Well, luckily we have some very smart folks with us today to help answer those questions. Sally Stockwell is the Director of Conservation at Maine Audubon. And Dave Publicover is a Doctor of Forestry, Senior Staff Scientist, and Assistant Director of Research at the Appalachian Mountain Club. Sally and Dave, we are so glad to have you with us today. My name is Kathleen Neal. I am the Senior Director of Policy and Partnerships here at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 13,000 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration, and advocacy, and MCV by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. A few technical notes for today. We will hear from our speakers first and then tackle your questions in a Q&A session at the end. You don't have to wait though, you can send questions to me through the chat whenever they occur to you. I will compile all of the questions, synthesize those with the similar themes, and ask as many as we possibly can in that Q&A session following the presentation. We ask that you not message speakers directly as we want their focus on the presentation, not the chat box. If you have any technical difficulties today, you can message Will Sedlak and he will help you out. This event is being recorded and the Lunch and Learn uh, video will be posted on our website later this afternoon, where you can also find recordings of all of our previous programs. Thank you again for joining us. And Sally, I will turn things over to you to kick, to kick it off. Well, thank you very much, Kathleen. I'm gonna get my screen ready here. Um, all right, so thanks everybody for joining today. Good afternoon on this lovely, sunny, snowy day here in Maine. Uh, I'm gonna start off by talking a little bit about how special our main forests are for biodiversity, <clears throat> a little bit about what's at stake, but it's kind of gonna be a whirlwind tour because then I'm gonna turn it over to Dave, who's gonna talk more about forests and carbon and climate. So we're really fortunate here in Maine to um, live in a very ecologically rich area. This is a great graphic that shows for the three degrees of latitude in Maine, we're kind of equivalent to 20 degrees of latitude in Europe in terms of the geographical climate and ecological diversity. Maine is also has relatively low human footprint. This is a map on the right that was put together by the Wildlife Conservation Society showing those light green areas in Northern Maine and Down East Maine, that's all relatively low human footprint. So that means it's still undeveloped, good forest habitat, and that it's a re really important wildlife corridor that's coming from Vermont, New Hampshire into Maine, and then from Maine up to Quebec and over to New Brunswick as well. And because of all this forest land here that Kathleen mentioned, we have an incredible array of birds that come here every year to breed in our forests, over 90 species, all different varieties. And you can see on the map on the right that was put together by National Audubon that these, all these green blobs represent the last best remaining forested blocks in the Eastern US. 
And you can see really clearly that big blob in Maine just jumps right out, right? It's so much bigger and more extensive than anywhere else. And consequently, it's been designated as a globally significant important bird area by the National Audubon and the Bird Conservation International. And the, the reason that um, it's so important for birds is because we have a variety of forest types here. We have coniferous forests or softwood for northern softwood forests, mixed woods and deciduous or uh, northern hardwood forests. And then there are different habitat features within each of these, those forests that different birds are attracted to. So for example, Blackburnian warblers love to sing from the tops of spruce trees. Scarlet tanagers love to sing from the tops of big oak and large canopies. We have Eastern wood peewees that like to hang out on the side of a, an opening in the canopy and fly out into that opening and feed on insects while they're flying. And then there's Canada warblers that like to hang out at the bottom of the forest, close to water in dense shrubs, or something like yellow-bellied sapsuckers or, or northern flickers that depend on dead standing wood to find their food. So the different types of forest, different places in the forest mean lots of different birds. And some of these birds are what we call short different distance migrants that come from the Southern US and back every year. Some are long distance migrants that come, go back and forth to South America every year. And some fly all the way up to Alaska across Northern Canada, but then back to Maine and jump off, flying over the Atlantic down to South America again in the fall. But it's not just about birds. Um, our main forests provide excellent habitat for both brook trout and Atlantic salmon as well. And Maine is the last stronghold for Eastern brook trout. We have over 50% of the nation's remaining wild populations, the most number of intact watersheds and ponds and lakes where these fish are still breeding. And then we also have the only population of Atlantic salmon here in Maine. And they not only live in the ocean, but they come up these streams to spawn and breed. And all of these rivers are super important to their future. The forest around the rivers is what creates the habitat for them. Maine is also unusual in that we have a nearly full suite of predators. Most of the other states in the East have lost this array of predators. The reason this is important is because it's a reflection of the fact that all of these animals need really large territories, large expansive connected forest land for their survival. But our forests here in Maine have changed a lot from the pre-European days to today. So pre-settlement times, uh, at least 75% of the landscape was covered with forests that are over 150 years old. And then those that were naturally disturbed by windstorms or big old trees falling over, so they were less than 150 years old, was maybe 25% of the, the forest at any one time. Today, you can see that the, these three age classes from 20 to about 80 years old constitute the bulk of our forests. Very few really young forests and less than 1% of Maine now is over 150 years old. So what does that mean for our wildlife and biodiversity? Well, young forests are important for a number of our forest birds and other species. About 40% of our main vertebrates will use these forests. But so things like chestnut-sided warblers, like these young stands, but they also can be found in, in small gap openings within more mature forests. And, um, <clears throat> and it's very easy to make young forests, but it's a lot harder to make old forests because these old forests are much more, they take a long time to grow. There's but these are the places that most of our wildlife species adapted to and evolved with over time. So an old forest is characterized by <clears throat> multiple layers of vegetation, different ages and sizes of trees, down woody tree material on the floor, standing dead wood, some big old legacy trees, maybe some small gap openings, 
And these are the places where we, so we see the most biodiversity, where we see um, trees that are large enough to support cavity nesting pileated woodpeckers, enough overstory and, and downwood for American Martin to move around, and then even special lichens and beetles that you only find in these older conditions. As it turns out, intermediate age forests, which are our most common forests in Maine from about 20 to 80 years old or so, are the least interesting to wildlife. The, those species that, that prefer early successional young forests don't really like this. Those species that prefer older mature forests might be found here, but not in the same, not to the same um, degree, not to the same number of individuals. You can't pack as many species in here. Now, along with this, we know that birds and other wildlife have seen a dramatic decline. So I like to say we're not only in a climate crisis, we're in a biodiversity crisis. And since 1970, we have lost at least 3 billion, there are 3 billion fewer birds out there across North America than there were in 1970, about 30% fewer. And for our eastern forest birds, that means we lost about 17%. They're down by 17%. Boreal forest birds, those birds that nest in northern Maine and up in Canada, down about 33%. So we're seeing some dramatic changes. Here's a, an example of Canada warbler. You can see just steady decline in the population level. But there are things we can do about this, <clears throat> which is why a number of years ago, Maine Audubon teamed up with the Maine Forest Service Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and the Forest Stewards Guild to adapt a program that was initiated in Vermont for Maine and we call it Forestry for Maine Birds. And we have created a series of guides for foresters, loggers and woodland owners to help them manage their woodlands with birds in mind. And the primary goal really is to increase the amount of mature, structurally complex forests out there on the landscape. Because we know that when we have more species diversity in the plants, we also see more wildlife diversity. And when we have species diversity, age diversity, structural diversity, that promotes more wildlife diversity. Think about an apartment. You can, you can pack a lot more people into an apartment building than a single family home. That's kind of what we're going after here. And we also were using birds as the hook to get people interested in thinking about how to manage their woodlands differently. But we know that as long as we manage for those birds, we're going to manage and take care of a lot of other wildlife species too, as long as we have different types of habitats and features within those, those forests, then we're going to bring along all these other wildlife species like the predators we talked about earlier, the fish we talked about earlier, but also turtles, wood salamanders, and even beetles and, and other insects. So, and we, these waterways are so important. We know 85% of our vertebrate species use riparian habitat. That's the habitat along streams or around pools sometime during their life cycle. And so it's really important to think about how we're managing those riparian areas in addition to the larger landscape. And then, you know, on, on the broader context, we can think about what else can we do to protect biodiversity going forward? We know things are going to change over time. We know the specific plants and animals might change over time. But if we think about protecting and connecting diverse landscapes, places that have mountains, streams, rivers, ponds, wetlands, all relatively close together, then we know we're gonna keep a pretty good amount of biodiversity on the landscape because you're gonna have low elevation, high elevation species and everything in between. But the other thing we need to do is reconnect these landscapes. So provide opportunities for plants and animals to move across the landscape. And in particular, to reconnect our streams where dams might be impeding movement or where culverts have collapsed and are no longer allowing fish and other <clears throat> species to move up and down the streams. So with that, I'm gonna stop and turn it over to Dave. I encourage questions and I am happy to talk to anybody who's interested afterwards 
if you want more information about this. All right, uh, thanks, Stop. Sally. Let me uh, let me get my technology going here. All right, uh, can, can folks see that? All right. Looks great, Dave. All right. So I'm going to reiterate a lot of what Sally said, but from the perspective of forest carbon, uh, which has become an increasingly interesting and important topic these days, uh, which Maine has been doing a lot of work on. <clears throat> So uh, just uh, a quick run through, uh, reiterating some of what uh, Sally said about the importance of Maine's North Woods. Uh, you may, may have seen many of these types of figures that show how uh, the North Woods is the blank spot on the map in terms of very low population density, uh, <clears throat> very low uh, uh, public road density, uh, very limited development or agricultural land, uh, unlike most of the Eastern United States, uh, the North Woods were never cleared for agriculture. They've remained continuously forested, uh, uh, you know, for, for reasons of soils and climate. Uh, you may have, this is a, a, you've seen variations of this. This is truly the dark spot on the map uh, in terms of uh, nighttime lighting. Uh, which is why uh, the AMC was to establish a dark sky park uh, in our main woods uh, lands up in the 100 mile wilderness uh, because of the lack of development in the region. Uh, again, this all comes together in the, in the human footprint that Sally showed. Uh, again, the, the, uh, the north woods of Maine are the most intact and least developed forest eastern, east of the Mississippi. And this has been recognized in a variety of state documents such as the Land Use uh, Planning Commission's Comprehensive Plan, uh, the state's Wildlife Action Plan, all of them recognize the unique nature of the North Woods in terms of being a large undeveloped forest. Uh, <clears throat> and in terms of its conservation value, the Nature Conservancy's Resilient and Connected Landscape Analysis uh, highlights the value of the North Woods because of its, uh, on the left is called local connectedness, it's a measure of fragmentation, uh, shows how well how well connected uh, the North Main Woods still is, uh, and it becomes an important part of the Nature Conservancy's resilient connected landscapes uh, portfolio in, in terms of identifying lands that are likely to be able to maintain biodiversity in the face of climate change. Uh, and it shows up in other areas, as Sally said, the important bird areas uh, and various other measures. Okay. So that makes uh, Maine's forests really important as a natural climate solution. And yeah, you've probably heard that term, but it's, it's basically actions with conservation and management actions that increase carbon storage uh, or reduce emissions from natural landscapes such as forests, wetlands, grasslands, and agricultural lands. And the value of Maine's forests as a natural climate solution is, was recognized in the work of, of the Maine Climate Council. Uh, so now we're in the position of uh, trying to discuss policy options that will uh, enhance Maine's value as a natural climate solution. Again, you've, many of you have seen this, uh, the, the, the forest cover trends in New England, the decline in forest cover throughout the settlement period, and particularly during the agricultural times of the, uh, of the 19th century, uh, the re regeneration and regrowth of uh, Eastern forests following the abandonment of agriculture and its movement to the Midwest. But essentially forest cover in New England and pretty much every state peaked in the 1970s. And we're now un undergoing a second wave of forest loss. Uh, a more severe probably in Southern New England that have more heavily developed areas. Really, if you look at the bars, Maine at, at the top has really uh, seen the least amount of forest loss in the 70s, uh, but that's unlikely to continue. So when we look at this in terms of carbon, this is uh, data from the Forest Service showing the, the level of carbon stocking in forests across the country. You can see the big forests of the Pacific Northwest uh, stand right out. But when we look at the east, we can see that the, the lowest carbon stocking, uh, the lighter green colors, are in the big woods of Maine, northern and eastern Maine. 
so it's kind of a flip side. Uh, they are uh, large undeveloped forests, but they also have relatively low carbon stock. And this is a consequence of the ownership pattern. Uh, you know, the big woods of, of Northern Maine have been the purview of large commercial timberland owners from the timber barons of the 1800s through the paper companies of the 1900s through the uh, investment owners and timberland management organizations of, of the 21st century. And <clears throat> essentially the driving factor in this type of ownership is the financially efficient production of timber. Uh, these owners own land to make money, uh, in some cases from development, but in most cases from timber harvesting revenues. And it's an unfortunate fact of forest economics that because of the long time frames involved and you know, the influence of, of discounting over decades, that if you are growing timber in a financially efficient manner, you are going to end up with young, low volume forests. Uh, it simply does not make financial sense to grow big old trees uh, or to maintain high volume forests. So the condition of the forests, uh, undeveloped but relatively low stocking, uh, are a consequence of financially uh, rational decisions. And this showed up in Sally's uh, graph on the age class distribution. Most of these forests are in, uh, again, this sort of mid-successional, this young to mid-successional stage where carbon stocking has not built up uh, to the extent that it would be in natural lands. <clears throat> and this is some more data from uh, the Forest Service showing carbon stocking in the different states of New England, uh, separated out by public land and private land. So <clears throat> the average for all land in New England, all forest in New England at, at the far left, that gray bar is about 25 metric tons of carbon per acre. Most states in the region are in the range of 25 to 35. Uh, again, you can see Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Vermont, all, all up close to or above 30 tons per acre. This, even this level falls far short of what natural forests are capable of. The two bars on the graph are derived from some studies of old growth forests, uh, which are up, upward around 50 tons per acre. What drives the average down across in New England are the lands of Northern Maine. And you can see the, uh, the third, fourth, and fifth groups from the left are all of Maine, Northern Maine, and Southern Maine. Uh, separated out by the eight Northern counties, they're dominated by the large commercial ownerships and the uh, eight so Southern counties that are dominated by smaller private ownerships and are more similar to the rest of New England. And we can see in Southern Maine, the carbon stocking is up around over 25 uh, tons per acre. In northern Maine, the private lands are about 17 and a half, probably about a third of the level of carbon stocking uh, that we might find in old growth natural stands. So this indicates the tremendous potential of forests in Maine, especially northern Maine, uh, to store uh, additional amounts of carbon. If we look at the, the trends over the last 15 years, we can see that all states in New England are increasing carbon storage in forests. Uh, like most forests in the country, uh, our northeastern forests are carbon sinks. And even though main stocking is at the, the gray bar at the low end is lags far behind the other states, it is still accumulating carbon. On the right, you can see the, the separation of ownerships in Maine and even the private lands in the north are accumulating carbon though at a fairly slow rate. So these forests, these large commercial forests are being managed sustainably from a carbon perspective, but at a very low level of carbon stocking. So the question is, how do we get them to be managed uh, sustainably for carbon stocking at higher levels of carbon? Now, at, at, at first, uh, first glance, this involves a trade-off, uh, carbon stocking and timber harvesting. Uh, if you want to increase carbon stocking in a forest, you know the easiest way to do it is to remove less carbon through harvesting. Uh, but that has trade-offs, okay? Northern Maine is the, the, the wood basket of Northern New England. It is, is, is the primary provider of wood fiber uh, across the region. And that has benefits. You know, there are certainly benefits of uh, 
providing wood locally. Uh, and to the extent that we reduced the harvesting uh, to uh, increase carbon stocking, we're likely to end up increasing wood imports, uh, whether, whether raw logs for, for mills or, or finished wood products. Uh, and that has negative consequences for climate change as well. So it's not a, it's not a simple answer. Uh, there, are, there are definitely trade-offs involved. <clears throat> now, just quickly looking at silviculture again, uh, kind of getting back to Sally's age class distribution, this is sort of a, a commercial management cycle. It's known as shelter wood, which is a, a more or less a two-stage clear cut. You have a young, even age stand, it grows up. You thin out the overstory, open it up enough so that you can get regeneration in there in, in stage five, and then you remove the overstory and you end up with a young, even age stand. And you repeat that cycle from steps two to six. So overall, the forest never really gets much older than 60 to 80 years old. Uh, it remains fairly young, fairly low stocking, uh, and structurally simple. On the other hand, you can take a different approach, which, which is, uh, goes by different names, exemplary forestry, uh, ecological forestry, where you try to manage in a forest in a way that more closely uh, resembles the complex mature forests of, uh, uh, of natural forests. So essentially, you, you know, instead of doing a, a shelter wood or a clear cut where you completely remove the overstory, you try to build up and retain that mature overstory. And you end up in a cycling between steps five and six, essentially managing a, a structurally mature complex forest. And eventually you can get to the point where you can maintain, manage this sustainably at a high stocking level. Uh, <clears throat> now getting from the young commercial stands to the higher volume, uh, older stands, is a transition, and how do we encourage that transition? Uh, <coughs> but again, when you get up into steps five and six, you can start to get uh, forests uh, that get into those older age classes and get beyond the 80 year old and end up with big old trees and, and build up your amount of standing down dead wood. Uh, so we know how to do it. The question is the economics uh, for the most part, are not favorable for this type of management. You will generally make less money managing forests this way than managing forests the other way, which is why this type of management is primarily practiced by public, public agencies such as the Maine Bureau of Parks and Lands, the, uh, the White Mountain National Forest, uh, and, and uh, NGOs such as the Appalachian Mountain Club, New England Forestry Foundation, and uh, <clears throat> and the nature conservancy, who have less, less uh, profit uh, motivation. So we know how to do this. Again, avoid forest loss, main, keep big trees, harvest less than growth. Uh, but also, uh, there are ways to do it to improve the stands. There was a study done by John Gunn and others uh, recently that showed that 40% of the forest stands in northern New England that they studied they considered understocked or degraded from a timber standpoint, which means these, these forests are meeting, not meeting their potential from either timber management or a carbon storage potential. So that there's tremendous potential there uh, to improve uh, the situation. And just earlier this week, a report was released by the Maine Forest Service, the University and New England Forestry Foundation, studying this exact question of how do we encourage or promote more forest carbon storage under a commercial forest regime, uh, which do not, where the economics do not favor that kind of management. Uh, and I haven't had a chance to read this, uh, but it's done by quite a reputable group. So I have, I have good faith in their results, uh, but they, they do basically come up with uh, management scenarios uh, by which commercial management can store 20% more carbon on the ground without reducing timber harvest? That's the big question, the trade-off between carbon storage and timber harvest. This seems to be a way where they're saying, well, you can have some, hey, you can, you can ha ha have some of your cake and still eat it. Uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with, 
excuse me, more intensive management that maintains the full growth potential of forests, you know, essentially rehabilitates some of that degraded forest uh, and targets more of the forest growth onto crop trees that'll be harvested for long lasting wood products. Uh, now, the one question is, what are the finances of this? And, and I don't really know. Uh, I'd be interested in seeing it. I assume this involves some financial loss. Otherwise, the commercial landowners would already be doing it. So the question becomes, when we get into our policy options, of what can we do to sort of meet these twin goals of maintaining uh, Maine as a local source of timber production, but also enhancing its role as a natural climate solution. Uh, obviously, the most uh, the, the first thing is to keep our forests as forests, avoid that amount of forest loss. Uh, education, certification have some value, probably more for smaller landowners than the large commercial landowners. Regulation is the blunt tool I consider. Uh, it's not really well suited for promoting good forestry. It's best suited for preventing bad forestry. The most interesting, I think, approaches are in five and six. You know, one is changing ownership. When you move ownership from commercial lands to publisher and NGO lands, you're going to change, a, a, make a change in management goals, uh, which is likely to be more targeted towards maintaining those types of old, high carbon, highly biodiverse forests that Sally was talking about. But under commercial management, you need to change the financial incentives. Uh, again, if we want private landowners to store more carbon, uh, given our current economic system, we're probably going to have to provide financial incentives. Uh, to my mind, the best way you can do that is to put a price on carbon to make it <clears throat> more expensive to emit it and make it more beneficial to store it. Uh, carbon offset markets are one way to do that. Uh, AMC has certainly taken advantage of those, uh, as, as have, have some others. Uh, they are the best tool we have right now to, to reward carbon-friendly management. Uh, now, the large commercial landowners have not entered the carbon markets in great degree because the price of carbon is currently not high enough to incentivize a change in management. Wood is still worth more cut for timber, even as pulpwood, than it is for carbon. So changing this economic calculus, I think, is probably part of the policy discussion that's going to be uh, really important moving forward. And, and I'm really interested to see how this, this recent report addresses the financial question. We know how to do it from a management perspective. The question is, how do we do it from a financial perspective? So I'm gonna end there and leave it open now for, for questions. So I'll turn it back over to Kathleen. Thank you both so much. Oh my goodness, we, um, we already have a bunch of terrific questions, but before we get into them, I just want to remind everybody that you will get a follow-up email later this afternoon with both a link to this recording and a whole bunch of information. Um, so there will be a, a link to a fact sheet about a bill that's currently working its way through the legislature that would propose that proposes to create a forest advisory board. There'll also be a link to uh, to sign a petition supporting the creation of that forest advisory board. And we'll share a bunch of information to help you learn more about the role that Maine's forests play in your community. So links to those studies that Dave mentioned, other reports like forestry for Maine birds and forestry investment funds, just a whole wealth of, of information, as well as some ideas about how you can work with your, your town, your local land trust and, and community organizations that are working to conserve forest land, manage our older forests and set aside reserves for biodiversity and carbon storage. So keep an eye out for that this afternoon. As always, feel free to forward it liberally and let, let your friends and family know what's going on. Uh, and then let's get into our questions. You can keep those coming. As I said, we already have a bunch of terrific questions and I'll, I'll try to gather them into to themes. So um, first, just wrapping our heads around 
the, the incredible resource that, that Maine's forests represent. So Sally, you started us off with a map that showed Maine as, as all green practically. <laughs> I, I love that. What percentage of those forests in Maine are categorized under large ownerships or commercial management versus just sort of out there? Uh, I don't actually have the statistics on that. Dave, do you know that? So the, the, the short answer is the bulk of Northern and down East Maine are still owned by large commercial um, ownerships or Appalachian Mountain Club, Nature Conservancy that has some large tracks up there as well. But in the Southern half of the state, most of that property is owned by small family, what we would call small family landowners. I, I, do you know the percents, Dave? Not exactly, but Maine has about 17 million acres of forest. I think there's about 10 million in Lupsy jurisdiction, most of which would be commercial, but that also includes Baxter State Park, NGO, and BPL lands. So I'd be willing to guess probably 50 to 60 half or maybe a bit more is large commercial ownerships in the state. Okay, okay. And within that, say say that chunk of, of owned by commercial, under commercial management, is it one company? Is it a handful of companies? Just trying to wrap our head around the... It, it's hard to keep track because there have been so many changes <laughs> from the large paper company ownerships. Now there's just multitude of investment owners with names like Great Northwoods and, you know, Northwoods Timberlands and things like that. Uh, there are a small number of really large companies like Irving and Weyerhaeuser that own close to a million acres. There's lots of owners that are in the, uh, you know, 50 to 250,000 acre range. I would guess in total, there's probably what, somewhere in the range of maybe 20 or 25 yeah. large owners that own probably at least 50,000 acres, but that's just a guess. Okay, thank you. Like I said, we're just trying to trying to get our, our wits about us here and understand what we're, what we're dealing with. Um, and Dave, you said too, that it's important to remember that, you know, if you, you own this as a commercial landowner, you're, you're looking to make money here. That, that makes sense. So is it safe to assume that the, that all of that land that is in com under commercial management is being logged on a, a regular basis, whatever that means based on regrowth and there 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 is there is great diversity. Uh, I mean not great diversity, but the great majority of those large commercial ownerships are being actively managed. Uh, but there is, you know, it's not uniform. There are you know, at one end of the scale, you have essentially probably Irving, which is very much into short rotation plantation management, you know, growing trees like corn. They are also, you know, they are the dominant owner in northern Maine. They're also they own about a million and a half acres. They're the largest ownership in the state. At the other end, you have some of the family ownerships like Baskahegan and the Pingrees and a lot of the lands managed by Prentice and Carlisle that are not of it, not as intensive. You know, they're, they're still financially oriented, but their, their management is probably somewhat more naturalistic. They're not doing a lot of plantation management. They really, it's, it's basically right now, two owners, Irving and Weyerhaeuser, are the, the dominant ones using short rotation plantations. But even the, the Pingrees and the Baskahegans are probably still managing most of their land for, you know, for trees less than 100 years old. What about one more sort of statistics question before we, we get into the, the what we do? Um, how much of the of Maine's forests are under management by by the tribes of Maine? I think the tribal ownership is pretty low. Yeah. A few percent. Uh, you know, the state and NGOs probably are in the, uh, I mean, overall, I think about 22% of Maine is conserved, but the biggest chunk of that is in big working forest conservation easements, 
which are, you know, basically protect the land from development, but it's still allowed commercial forestry to go on. I would say probably somewhere maybe eight, eight to 10% of the state might be in public or NGO ownership. And if you look at the public ownership, I don't know what the percentage is. I would say probably maybe half or a little bit less is actively managed by BPL. I mean, they have a higher degree of set asides for ecological or recreational regions. You have Baxter State Park, a small a small portion part of which is managed uh, as the scientific management area. So, okay, uh, thank you. And is even there even a very a... oh, let me oh. just say probably a a much smaller percentage, maybe two to three percent of the state, uh, is in what we'd call wilderness or reserve. And is there sort of a, a magic number in terms of the size of a parcel where it makes sense to have a an intentional forest management plan? You know, there there are a lot of us who who maybe you know we've got folks on the call today who are live on a few acres. Is it a good plan to just let nature take its course, let it be? Or at what point do you say, I've got enough land here, I should really seek some guidance and, and think about an intentional forest management strategy? I can, yeah, I, I can. Oh, go ahead, I, Sally. I'll just start with that and you can add to it, Dave. Um, you know, 10 acres or more is, is great. There are, we work through our Forestry for Maine Birds program. We work with a lot of landowners who have just a couple of acres. No, I should say, I mean, we work with a lot of landowners that have 10 acres or more who can do active management and really make a difference in, in uh, creating better habitat and, and better forest conditions. Smaller than that, it gets hard just to, unless you want to do it all by yourself, it, it's just really kind of hard. But management plans the, in the main forest service, um, you know, they they require a management plan for 10 acres or more if you want to do sort of <clears throat> And so thinking. if you're on less than that, just let it be. There's some things you can do. You know, one of the things that we, we like to talk to landowners about is that messy is actually good. So a lot of people like to go out and clean up the forest. They, they want it to look like a park. And I've had people, landowners say to me, oh, man, you just saved me a whole lot of work. Now I don't have to go out there and clean all that stuff up. So that's one thing you can do. You can you can clear out some of the the dense underbrush that is um, maybe getting in the way of trees growing bigger. There's so there are some some things that one can do on a small level if you're inclined that way. Otherwise, yeah, just leave it alone. Yeah, I mean, I th I think that's about right. Uh, my in-laws own eleven acres in New Hampshire and couple decades ago, I helped them do a small timber harvest on that, thinning out some, some old field pine. Uh, the Society for Protection of New Hampshire Forests a number of years ago did, did a study on ownership fragmentation in the state. And they basically thought that 50 acres was probably the minimum threshold for having really a, a sort of active timber management program, even though you're not going to be harvesting timber every year with that size of a parcel. But uh, that that seems to be another good threshold, you know, and then that midsize is more like it's not really regular timber management production. It's you, you can call it wildlife habitat management or boutique forestry or whatever you whatever you want. So. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, yes. And I just saw a comment just to clarify the management plan is not required, but it, if you it is a good idea to have that. Um, is, so is there a, you, you can work you can work with a forester to develop that management plan and um, chart your course forward you know yeah in in New Hampshire 10 acres is the minimum size for enrollment in current use which is the sort of you know taxation program that protects open space I don't know if is there a minimum for the main tree growth law uh, I believe it is 10 acres as well. Okay. Yes, more than the same, yes. <laughs> so one of the things that we have seen with, you know, with our changing climate is the spread of, of invasive species. Are there, um, you know, what can, what can, what should we be managing for when it comes to invasives and how can we help uh, in, in forests of all sizes? 
That is such a sticky issue right now and becoming worse all the time. <clears throat> Luckily, we do have a really great program in Maine here through the Maine Natural Areas Program, which is part of the Agriculture Conservation and Forestry Department that has tons of resources on what to do. But the bottom line is try, try to reduce invasive species on your property as much as possible. It's probably not possible to actually get rid of them all, but I I learn how to identify them, figure out where they are, it limit the spread, and then and then um, there are some in some situations where they've gotten so bad. Sometimes it's really hard to do anything about it, but in other cases, if you can limit the spread, take out small patches, get rid of it, that's really helpful and. Also, with the through the um, through the Maine Forest Service, they now have a new program that is providing funding to help landowners and municipalities do some of this invasive species control in forests. One of the things that we're learning with certain species, anyways, take glossy buckthorn, it is if you open up the canopy too much, that actually invites the spread of glossy buckthorn. If it's if it's already there to begin with, and maybe not so bad, but then, so you have to balance your goals in terms of the forest management along with what's gonna happen with invasive species. So if you can reduce the invasive species before you do your harvest, you're gonna be in better shape. All right. Let's talk a little bit. We've got a bunch of questions about carbon, carbon storage and carbon offsets. And one of the um, one of the questions, you know, feels like a, per a perpetual question in the news is what how do we measure carbon offsets and do they they store the amount of carbon that we we think they're storing? Can you say a little bit more about that? Like what's the method and the how does the how does the math work on that? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I could I could go on for two hours about that. There's certainly a, has been a lot of criticism you've seen about carbon offsets. A lot of those are related to large tropical projects that were you know developed by European countries under the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, the U.S. the standards and and protocols and verification in in U.S. for carbon projects is I think is pretty robust. But essentially, the basic question is additionality, which is if you're going to get paid for storing carbon, you have to be doing a better than average job. You have to be storing carbon above and beyond what's considered business as usual or common practice. And there are different registries and different protocols that measure that differently. Uh, essentially, like the, the California Compliance Market Protocol measures you against the regional average baseline. So within you know, the ecological region of western, northwestern Maine, what is the average carbon stocking? And if your carbon stocking is above that at the beginning of your project, you get credit for that amount that's above, above the baseline. And then over time, as your forest continues to accumulate carbon, you will get credit for those, that additional increment of carbon. And you can get those credits for the life of the project, which depending on the protocol is either, uh, most projects these days are going with the American Carbon Registry, which is 40 years, uh, the California program is 100 years. Uh, but you are basically committed to maintaining that level of carbon. So essentially it serves as a term carbon easement. Uh, and you have to go in and at a periodic basis, you have to, you know, all, all your calculations, all your measurements are independently verified by a third party body, uh, you know, like a, a financial, like a financial audit. You have to go in and periodically re-inventory uh, to sort of true up your, your, your carbon stocking estimates. You have to be re-verified, you know, on a rate, you know, basically every 10 years or so to make sure the carbon is still out there. Uh, so there's been a lot of lot of questions about whether say ngos should be eligible co for carbon markets because they were going to preserve the carbon anyway you know so really you're not getting any additional carbon storage which would be you know happening above and beyond you know nature conservancy is going to preserve an old growth stand whether or not they get paid to do it 
But the way the carbon protocols are set up, they try to take intent out of it. Basically, if you're doing a better than average job of carbon storage, you get credit for it, whether or not you would have done it any, anyways. Uh, and that's really the fairest way to do it. You know, otherwise, you know, otherwise you're going to say, well, this timber liquidator would we'd be eligible for carbon markets because we have to pay him to store the carbon, but the Nature Conservancy would not. You know, so you're essentially penalizing the good guys and rewarding the bad guys. We basically want to reward everybody. Yeah, that that makes a lot of just intuitive sense. And and I heard you say it, it depends on the program, right? There are what the term is, whether it's a 20 year or a 40 year, or 100 year sort of carbon easement. What happens at the end of that term, whatever the length is? Is there a because we don't want to just go in and, and say clear cut after that <laughs> trade? How do we sort of continue that progress? Well, well essentially. So. Say a carbon project with the California registry, you can accumulate carbon for up to 100 years uh, and get credits for up to 100 years. But then you have to maintain beyond your crediting period, you have to maintain that carbon for 100 years beyond that. So the obligations to keep that carbon storage extend beyond the last carbon you get credited. Once the project ends decades from now, yeah, you're free to clear cut. But, you know, forest, forests are, are tricky. <clears throat> One of the other critical criteria for a carbon project is permanence. And with forests, that's hard to me measure because no forest is truly permanent. You know, if you capture methane from a feedlot and destroy it, that's permanent. That can't be undone. But essentially, I think they've taken the approach that, you know, the American Carbon Registry with a 40 year uh, term, they basically figure if we haven't solved the climate change project, you know, problem in 40 years, we got bigger problems than what's going to happen to the forest. So they're, they're kind of treating it as this is something that's critical in the near term, you know, we'll figure out the long term later. I wonder if part of the long term includes not just carbon, carbon sequestration, but really changing the paradigm in terms of what we're incentivizing. So, you know, more complex forest manage, managery, uh, silviculture, like, is that the sort of thing that we're, we're looking at for longer term or? Yeah, I mean, I, I think again, as we said, you know, if, if your goal is making money off your land, you're gonna end up with young, low volume, simple forests. Uh, un under our, you know, current system of, you know, private land ownership and, and you know, our New England states or gen at least Maine and New Hampshire are not very big on forest regulations. They basically want to keep you from screwing up the water, but they're not going to tell you how to manage your forest. So, you know, essentially, if you want them to change how they manage their forests, you're going to have to pay them to do it in one way or another. Uh, and carbon storage is is one way. I, I think anything beyond that, you know, it, it's tricky. You know, I, I, I kind of describe forestry sometimes as being a parent. There are a lot of ways to do it right. And you can pass a law that says you can't beat your child, but you can't pass a law that says be a good parent, you know, because it's impossible to define in regulation. So, you know, I, I think, you know, we've talked about the goals of uh, a main forest advisory board. You know, one of the, the things that I would think they would be a big subject of discussion for them is what is the appropriate way to incentivize better forest management? You know, and then, um, you know, public, and, uh, should we be spending public money on that? So, Sally, go uh, ahead. Yeah, I'll add a couple of things to that, Dave. Um, the report that you referred to, the, there is recommendation to help provide some additional funding to landowners to sh make the shift to this longer rotation situation. Once you get that forest to an older condition, then you've got some really good quality saw logs that you can market and you can keep doing that in a, uh, in, you know, periodically over time and store more carbon at the same time. So there are some benefits long-term, it's, but it's getting to that point that's the biggest challenge. 
But in addition to that, you know, we're we're working with um, some folks on trying to change to bring in some more some more specifics, both through the forest certification program and through conservation easements that target these ideas of, hey, let's at least identify opportunities for some increasing the carbon stock, <coughs> stocking levels, increasing the um, amount of mold or more mature forests, protecting our waterways, water, riparian habitat, protecting some of the um, <clears throat> some of the rare or significant wildlife habitats that are out there. And, and then, you know, there's the opportunity to increase the number of ecological reserves we have out on the landscape too. That's another place that we know we have better, as Dave pointed out on our public lands, we have higher stocking and some of this more old forest, but that's also true on our ecological reserves and will be over time. So there, there are other, opportunities out there. It's not going to be a one size fits all approach. I'm definitely going to remember this, you know, forestry to parenting corollary there. Thank you, Dee. We're, we're looking for the lot, lots of different ways to, to do the do a good job. Um, and that to me seems like it could be one of the one of the real benefits of a forest advisory board is that you get more heads together, right? To say, what does good forestry look like? What in your minds would be the, the qualifications to, to get engaged or to participate in a board like that? Um, what would you be looking for in a, your ideal forest advisory board? Well, I mean, we have one in New Hampshire and I've been, I've been on it for more than 20 years and it's basically set up to bring you know, it, 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 in some ways in, in New England, where we're, we're, we're relatively small states and everybody knows each other, it's kind of a round up the usual suspects. But you want representatives of the state agencies. You want representatives of the commercial landowners. You want, you want somebody from, you know, the, uh, the small woodlot owners. You want somebody from the consulting forestry community. You want somebody from, the, you want scientists from the university. Uh, you know, so essentially it becomes, a mutual education uh, sort of society, rather than you know arguing about policies and dueling op-eds, you know you have a chance to to share perspectives. I mean, we did back in the '90s. Maine did had a uh, a four-year project called the the Maine Forest Biodiversity Project, which <clears throat> brought together you know dozens of, of stakeholders uh, to talk about these issues, and it was really beneficial as a mutual understanding. You know. The, the large landowners got to understand what are the concerns about scientists and environmentalists about biodiversity. You know, the environmentalists got to learn, well, what are the constraints that the large landowners are operating under? You know, what is preventing them from, you know, changing their practices in the way we wanted, wanted to see? Uh, and so I think, you know, I, I, that's, that's the, the best way is to get diverse perspectives together, understand each other's concerns and constraints, and hopefully come up with, you know, solutions for some of these, some of these issues. And don't forget the NGOs, Dave, you didn't mention them. <laughs> well, I said environmentalists, I meant like, you know, Audible. No, but I, in your initial list of who should be on the Forest oh, yeah. Advisory Board. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> well, it's, it's funny, the last question I was going to ask is, are there examples from other states that are that are doing this well, or are, are we the leaders? And I think I, I heard you say New Hampshire's Forest Advisory Board has been around for 20 some yeah, years? It was established in, I think, 1995. They probably in the wake of the Northern Forest Lands Council recommendations. Uh, so I there you go. I guess, I guess there are examples from right, uh, right next door. Um, and the other New England states have forest advisory boards as well, right? I'm I'm not sure what the situation is in okay. other states. Well, I vaguely remember that this may be in our fact sheet, which will be linked in this afternoon's email. So that's a perfect transition. Look for that this afternoon. Sign that petition about uh, uh, supporting a forest advisory board. Thank you so much, Sally, Dave all of you for joining today. Uh, it's been a really interesting conversation be back in this space next week to explore federal Indian policy, the impacts on the Wabanaki nations in Maine and beyond. 
Some of you may have seen uh, Professor Joseph Kalt, who is co-director of the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government, is going to be with us next week. Professor Kalt did a, is a co-author of a, a fascinating study about the economic impact of the Maine Indian Settlement Act, Indian Claims Settlement Act on the Wabanaki Nations. And he's going to be with us next week to, to walk us through that study, tell us what's going on, and, and answer our questions. I hope to see all of you there. Until then, get out in our forests and, uh, and enjoy. And um, thank you again for joining us today. Have a great weekend.